Hey, good morning. How's everyone? So, last few days we've been here a lot. Yesterday, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Leonard Malardna. And you also, I hope, enjoyed the debate uh, from IQ2. And today, I have the very special privilege of uh, hosting here in my office in New York City uh, both uh, Jennifer Kaplan and Barnaby Marsh and they are the authors of this wonderful book How Luck Happens. I know the camera is kind of uh, uh, <laughs> skewed in a way that uh, you have to guess but if you can't then you shouldn't be watching this. Okay, so How Luck Happens Janice Kaplan, Barnaby Marsh, using the science of luck to transform work, love, and life. Once again, the book is How Luck Happens, using the science of luck to tra transform work, love, and life. Janice Kaplan, New York Times bestselling author of The Gratitude Diaries, and Barnaby Marsh, former CEO of, um, of Templeton, and <coughs> Uh, now very involved in the philanthropy area mm -hmm. and a wonderful guest of mine <coughs> and uh, uh, he's also uh, working at Princeton University at the uh, Center for Advanced Study Center for Advanced Study mm -hmm. so I've been reading this book I haven't finished it yet but it's amazingly well written and if you want to create your own luck I think you might want to read it so um, Janice uh, why don't you start and say how this project came about? <clears throat> well, Barnaby and I had worked together um, when Barnaby was at Templeton and I was writing the Gratitude Diaries. <laughs> and, yeah, um, and uh, you know, one of the principles of the book is that you make luck happen, you make things happen. And so Barnaby, who was very good at staying in touch, uh, mm -hmm. stayed in touch after, after Gratitude was finished and he asked me what I was going to mm -hmm. work on for my next book. And when I mentioned luck, he said, hey, you know, when I was a Rhodes Scholar, I wrote about risk, and uh, risk is really close to luck. And we thought, what an interesting partnership. Uh, Barnaby's an academic, I'm a journalist and a popular writer, so putting our abilities together um, might be a nice way to make luck. I've always, <clears throat> I've always thought of luck as opportunity meeting preparedness. That's been my definition of luck, but you know, over the years, have gone into synchronicity and all that. We'll talk about it, but let's ask Barnaby. So Barnaby, how did you get um, interested in this topic and yeah. what's the, how did this book happen? So I'm, I'm, I'm trained as a scientist, uh, but I always thought there's something else going on here. And some people seem to get really a lot luckier than others, and I want to know why that was the case. And uh, I've studied a lot of different things. Um, and I'm particularly interested in how people reach their potentials and was realizing that a lot of people actually fall short of what they're capable of. Uh, often because they're trying too hard to achieve something, but they're not trying in the right way. So one of the big findings, we followed people in this book and we followed very lucky people. One of the things we found was that lucky people tend to be very generous to others. They tend to be very caring. Uh, they take care of each other, uh, they're loving in a very broad, uh, broad and generous way. And when we looked behind that at what was going on, basically some people were getting a lot of luck because they were making luck for themselves and they were making luck for others. And then that was cascading and it was multiplying itself. Um, and so that was a really, that was a really um, interesting finding because a lot of times when you're looking at chance events, you're not looking at the human element that goes on behind the chance events that results in good things happening. So, um, you know, in my mind, um, chance, randomness, unpredictability, serendipity, we can go a little bit into synchronicity as well. Um, actually, could you please close the door? Yeah, and close the door. So, all these things are actually uh, part of, of the matrix of good luck, you know. 
what we call randomness, I personally think could be called unpredictability because randomness implies inherent randomness. Unpredictability implies, I, to me it seems random, but maybe there's an underlying pattern. So the reason I'm saying this is as you were researching this book, <clears throat> did you come across any underlying patterns that um, are common to good luck? I mean, a lot of times, Deepak, when you think about when we think about randomness, mm. it's just because we don't understand what's really going on underneath the surface. Right. We don't see necessarily how we're behaving as part of the fabric of reality and the fabric of social interactions. Um, but when you look a bit deeper, you see all these things happening beneath the surface, and it starts making a lot more sense. So that was a it's a big part of this book is what's happening under the surface. Mm and how it's possible to tap into that by being just more aware of what's going on and making a good effort, um, but also being part, being in sync with your surroundings and um, orienting time and effort in a way that reflects who you genuinely are so that you can reach your fullest potential. We were also interested, I think, in how Deepak, an, an individual, can, inter can interfere, in, intervene in some of those unpredictable or random events. And uh, Barnaby and I at one point talked about chaos theory, you know, the concept that the butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil causes the tornado in Toronto or whatever it may be. There are many variations Bangladesh. on it. <laughs> there you go, okay. Um, and um, so, uh, Barnaby and I discussed that and I said to him, well then doesn't that mean that things are so complex that there's really nothing we can do about it? And he pointed out that between those two events occurring, there are so many other things that are also occurring. And there are so many places that an individual can step in and can change that current and can change where that air is flowing and can change the effect that they have. And so I think that was really important to me to understand that we have more control over some of the things in our lives than we think we do. And um, there are great mysteries in the universe that we don't understand, and there are events that happen that we don't understand, and those have to be. Um, but to also know that there are times that we can step in and make things happen in the direction that we want them to, I think is, uh, is nice to know and is yeah, really absolutely. important and was one of the goals of the book. I love these comments that we're seeing as oh, yeah. well. So thanks from everyone. All over the wonderful world, yeah. comments. By the way, my friend Rishikesh Dixit from India, he just asked, where are you? So um, uh, Rishikesh, the real answer is I'm non-local, but uh, at this moment we are localized in my office in New York, uh, mm -hmm. Deepak Home Base, and this is uh, the little space we're in. So once again, <clears throat> I'm talking to uh, Janice Kaplan and Barnaby Marsh, and the book is How Luck Happens, Using the Science of Luck to Transform Work, Love, and Life. Let me <clears throat> just read to you the chapter uh, titles so you'll get some idea of what's in this book. So part one, Understanding Luck. Chapter one, Prepare to be Lucky. Chapter 2, some people have all the luck and you can be one of them. Chapter 3, pick the statistics you want to be. Then part 2 of the book is about <clears throat> how to get lucky. Skate to where the puck will be. Like that. Skate, uh, connect to the power of other people. Zig <clears throat> when others zag. The power of persistence and passion. How many eggs in your basket and how many baskets? The lucky break that really counts. Um, part three is targeted luck. How to get a job at Goldman Sachs or anywhere else you want. <laughs> get lucky in love. Make lucky kids. Part four, the other side of luck. Uh, chapter 13 is about bad luck. Why your worst moment can be your luckiest. Chapter 14, the ambulance in your backyard. Chapter 15, how to get lucky in a disaster. Uh, mm -hmm. Part 6, the big picture, the lucky path, find your compass. Chapter 17, the lucky attitude, believe that you can make luck. So that's a very complete, uh, exhaustive, mm -hmm. uh, 
I would say, scientific um, look at luck. So, which was your favorite chapter, Janice? Well, I was just going to say, um, uh, chapter 17 is greatly focused on you. Um, oh. and, uh, and a meeting that, I that you have to, I know, you said you hadn't finished, you have to. Um, and a meeting that we had in your office to, to talk about luck and some of the things that we learned about that. And so after going through all of what you just described in, in the chapters and the principles and the foundations in everyday life, we ultimately got to the question, the bigger question, which we gratefully used your insights on, on how do you make a lucky life? Mm -hmm. And what does a lucky life mean? And um, of course, a lucky life means something different to, to everybody, but mm -hmm. ultimately that's the goal. The goal is not just a lucky event happening right now. The goal is not just getting that job or even, frankly, meeting that person, um, though those are all things that we want to make luck for along the way. But the ultimate goal is being in a position where you can look back and say, I put it all together and made that lucky life. And so that was the sort of yes, ultimate yeah. goal in the book. It was also my favorite chapter, Deepak, uh, because it has to do with us each fulfilling our, our highest um, calling and our highest possibility. And we wrote this book uh, because we want to help to understand luck better so everyone can be a little bit luckier. And we found in writing this that a lot of times people aren't lucky because they're not really chasing the right goals. And so if you keep your, your, your focus on the right sorts of things in the right ways, good things happen. And it's a, in many ways the book has many examples of that, that I found when we were researching this to be very inspirational and, um, and helpful. Yeah. And I was also inspired by the idea of turning bad luck to good because so often we think something terrible has happened and how do we possibly move on from that and to hear some of the stories of people, you know, for Barnaby and me, fortunately, this was about taking luck to make a good life better, but there are so many people who really have had terrible blues of in their course. lives and, uh, and understanding what you can do to, to turn that yeah, around. You know, as, as a physician, I see people who <coughs> are diagnosed with um, uh, terrible illness and sure. they turn it into an opportunity exactly. for exactly. Uh, consciousness. Yeah. So, um, now, you know, a lot of luck's about lining things up the right way too, or being in the right in the right zone with the right people, with the right thinking and the right thoughts, and then good things can happen. And conversely, sometimes if things aren't lined up right, or you're not with the right people, or not with the right thoughts, things just don't seem to be happening, and they don't happen. Um, so there's some of that, that that goes on as well, I think. So you know. <coughs> Well, I was once writing a book on uh, leadership long time ago, and it became the basis of a course at uh, Columbia University at the business school, and uh, also at uh, Kellogg. Actually, I've given that uh, course almost everywhere now over the years. But as I was uh, researching the book, and that's called The Soul of Leadership, for those, those of you who uh, may have read it. So one of the things, you know, I did was I was talking to a lot of great, extraordinary leaders, people like Oscar Arias and Costa Rica, Nobel laureates, mm -hmm. <coughs> business leaders, and uh, leaders in uh, various positions, business, politics, community leaders, and, you know, I would ask them, what's the secret of your success? And they not give their own reasons. I worked very hard, I went to the right school, my parents brought me up in a way that uh, I had great self-esteem. So it was all about, you know, self-esteem, confidence, etc. But at the end, there was not, without any exception, without any exception, um, with uh, all the people that I spoke to, all the people. They said one of the following things. They said I was lucky, or God was on my side, or it seemed a state of grace, or um, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. A lot of people use the word synchronicity or meaningful coincidences. And after a lot of thinking, I realized that they were saying the same thing, but using different mm -hmm. phrases or different language. Now, in the ancient wisdom traditions of India, where 
I draw all my inspiration from in Vedanta, if you look at pure consciousness, you know, which is at the background of all modes of knowing and experience, it doesn't matter who is having the experience, you, me, Barnaby, uh, a crocodile or an eagle or a bat, the common ground is still awareness. You know, the, the experience is different, the mode of experience is different, it's species specific, but the common ground is awareness. You've got to have awareness for any experience, mental, perceptual, whatever. So if you look at the Vedanta and they say, what, what are the properties of this common ground of all experience? So here they are. Number one, it's a field of all possibilities, infinite possibilities. It's a field where everything is inseparable with everything else. Now, you know, I, when I use words like quantum entangled, I annoy the physicists, so forget that. But everything is inseparably one with everything else, number two. Number three, this is where our intentions have their source, after all. All intention has to have a source, and it has its source in consciousness, but our intentions get camouflaged by our ego identities, mm. so sometimes they, you know, get directed in other ways and they lose their power. But if they are not overshadowed by the ego, then the intention itself has the organizing power for its own fulfillment. And then also that consciousness is a field of unpredictability, thank God, because if it was predictable, there would be no creativity. Mm -hmm. So people who kind of happen to go beyond their ego identity, people who have the ability to have a subtle intention and let go, people who are inspired by love, compassion, joy, equanimity, or just the desire for helping others, um, seem to tap into this deeper field of luck, which is synchronicity. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you have anything to say in response to that whole idea? Mm -hmm. That, you know, there are dy mechanics of luck at the level of the mind, mm -hmm. at the level of behavior, the level of opportunity, but the deeper, deepest aspect of luck is that state of grace or flow mm -hmm. where everything seems to fall into place mm -hmm. by itself. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, or, or not. I mean, oh, so yeah. there's sometimes <laughs> bad luck too and that's where a lot of pieces of fabric converge mm -hmm. for things that happen that we we perceive as being bad. Right. I mean they don't they might not actually be bad in the long run but we seem we perceive them as being tragic or very sad. But again if we go deeper and 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 they in, in in just reflecting on this, what's really important is that interconnection between people and the difference that people make, mm -hmm. and then the minds your mindset and your outlook, and your realization that it's all part of one, one fabric. And the question is where, you know, where you want to be, and where, as a as a being, where you are on that fabric is really important. Um, and so we, in, in the book, we, we talk about different places where people are in their life and then how things can seem to just enter this state of flow in the most efficient way uh, or not. Some of these things just sort of seem to fall apart. And a lot of times that's just because the background pieces are just not in order. They're not in harmony. And if there's not harmony, then it's hard for things to come together in a way that's, that's beneficial. For, for oneself and for others as well. well. Deepak, I really love the principles that you just outlined because I think um, there's a sense of awareness uh, that's really important and there's a sense of, I like your idea of losing your own ego and, mm -hmm. and letting the world exist a bit more, but um, there are also so many things that occur around us all every day. As you said, there are so many possibilities. There are millions and billions of things occurring around us that we can take advantage of or not. And um, in actually a very scientific way, one of the problems is our actual physical attention. What we can pay attention to, what we can see, what we mm -hmm. do, yeah. what we will take advantage of. And, 
and somehow understanding how to layer your attention so that it can get you to the place that you want to be so that you can see those opportunities, mm -hmm. you can see those possibilities, you can see those positive things mm -hmm. um, rather than sometimes getting mired in all the negativity that is so easy to and, and to look for positivity and see that from that you can often make luck also mm -hmm. because believing that something good is going to happen um, is really one great way to, <laughs> to start to make it happen. Process, yeah. You know, I was also thinking, just as you were both speaking, that good and bad are from the individual's perspective, right? right? Yeah. Uh, whereas if you go beyond the individual into this pure knowing or pure consciousness or uh, where all is inseparable with all, then there's evolution happening all the time with a kind of correction of the course periodically. Mm -hmm. And that correction of the course periodically, we as humans interpret as bad luck, mm -hmm. whereas yeah. Yeah. all is basically like a spiral, you know, evolving mm -hmm. yeah. in yeah. the direction of more uncertainty, more creativity, yeah. more love, more inseparability. Basically, evolution with um, self-organizing and self-correcting dynamics, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which are course corrections, which we as humans call bad luck. That's interesting. That's an interesting that way was, to look at mm -hmm. it. That was yeah. just a thought as you yeah. were yeah. both speaking. So, my friends, this is the book, How Luck Happens, Using the Science of Luck to Transform Work, uh, Love and Life, uh, Janice Kaplan and Barnaby Marsh, it's in all the bookstores and I will uh, make sure when I post it on other uh, websites and social networks to give the link to this um, and also we can link to a bookstore, Amazon, Barnes & Noble or just find it yourself, go to an online bookstore or a bookstore next to your home or in your neighborhood Pick it up and you might get lucky. Any last words? Oh, thank you. How's yeah. that? <laughs> and that's like, and that's our that's our hope and our wish that not only that, if the book's useful, then share it. Share it with others that you know, you care about, that you are concerned about, or even those that you might not ordinarily think of sharing things with, because it's through sharing of, of ideas and goodwill that we all become more interconnected. And the more we can collectively harness the power of good luck, then uh, it'll be a better world, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you tomorrow. Aurora Carlson is a friend of mine from Sweden, and I'm sure she's going to go pick up the book uh, in English or Swedish. If it's already <laughs> thanks for all your comments. Thanks, uh, and thanks yes, Aurora. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And... Uh, uh, I might not see you tomorrow. I'm traveling to Tucson, Arizona or somewhere, but we'll be in touch. Take care. Good luck. <laughs> Make your own luck. Bye-bye.